the Capital Forum's interview series. My name is Joe Tipograph, and we are delighted to have Bert Four here with us today. As background, Bert is the president of the American Antitrust Institute, an independent competition advocacy organization. Previously, Bert was senior executive at the FTC's Bureau of Competition, was an attorney in two different law firms in Washington, D.C., and was a CEO of a retail company. Bert, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure, Joe. All right, let's dive right in. Um, First, I want to talk about the transition to storytelling. In the, the merger guidelines, we saw in 2010 a rewrite that, that said that market definition was no longer necessarily the starting point, uh, that, that competitive effects could inform market definition. Uh, in, in other words, the structural argument is not always overriding. The story can sometimes be what the agencies focus on. W what are you seeing in this area? Well, certainly there has been that uh, transition. My hope is that uh, a reliance on structure to give some degree of predictability and also efficiency to the administration of the merger control laws will continue in some fashion. It's obviously, uh, it can't be the be all and the end all and certainly isn't in today's uh, approach to uh, antitrust. But um, there are also problems in focusing too much on effects. I mean, let's, let's talk about what antitrust uh, is really about. It's about prediction. Everything that's interesting in this field seems to me to be about predicting the future. Whether it's, uh, will this merger raise prices? Will this merger reduce innovation? Will it reduce choice? It's all in the future. So what do we know about the future? Well, we, we don't know very much about the future, and our ability to predict is quite limited. So when we develop a system, a process that emphasizes uh, uh, proving the future, we've pretty much already determined the outcome, which is if you're going to go to court and there's a high level of, of proof as to what's going to happen, you lose. That is to say, uh, the, uh, the firms that want to do the merger are going to win more often than not because the burden of foretelling the future in a way that's convincing to a judge, it's storytelling. But it's storytelling about the future, not about the past. And, and it seems to me that our court system is oriented more toward determining what the facts were in the past. Did somebody hit somebody? Did somebody agree to fix prices? But in antitrust, we're worried about uh, what's going to happen, especially in a merger, and we're worried about what remedies are going to work. What does that mean? Uh, in a beer merger right now, it means can a third party that has been running a uh, a wine and uh, liquor distribution be a great beer company. Maybe it can, maybe it can't. Uh, how much proof do we need to get to the point where that's an acceptable outcome and remedy for, for this case? So I'm very interested in what the ability to predict is and on whether uh, if we go too far in uh, in, in setting uh, the requirements of proof about the future, uh, how we, what we're actually doing in terms of the outcomes. And also, the more we debate effects, the more difficult it is to predict what the agencies will do, what the courts will do, and the larger the expense for the process, because more in, how do you limit the information that's going to come in when you're talking about what might affect the future? But doesn't it also present some opportunities for competition uh, regulation? We, we've seen over the years the agencies have a, a difficult time sometimes proving the market actually exists, mm -hmm. proving a relevant market. So, so now when we have executives talking about the way they perceive certain competitors mm -hmm. and uh, talking about what opportunities might exist if those competitors were no longer as competitive as they once were. 
that can inform the future. And so even if there's challenges with the market definition, there's an opportunity for the agencies to challenge uh, that, that deal. That's right. And I, I agree that the uh, market definition issue uh, can be overstated. I don't think you can do without it entirely. But on the other hand, let's look at how we define markets. Will somebody enter in two years? Another prediction. And it's a prediction based on the uh, uh, actions in the future of companies that aren't even in the case. Sure. Uh, so fine. We want all, I think we should get all the evidence uh, that we can when we're talking about uh, these predictions. Uh, but I also think that we shouldn't fool ourselves into believing that this is a scientific system or that it can be held to the same degree of, uh, of, of evidence that you would want in a criminal law case. Um, we, need, we need some flexibility. We also need some of the predictability that focusing on structure can give. Now, I think that in the U.S. Uh, in the last 30 years, we have gotten it wrong. That is to say, we have looked at mergers and we have said, mergers are virtually always a good thing for the economy, for the society, for consumers, and they're not. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that uh, many mergers are negative in their impact or neutral or don't work out the way the people inside the companies predicted they would. What does that mean? Well, it, it means to me that at least in the areas where you're going to have a lot of concentration, that the presumption is backwards. Instead of presuming that the merger is going to be in the public interest and let it go, we should be presuming in that very small category at the top that uh, the burden should be on the defense to show why the public is going to benefit. So I think. I think we've worked ourselves into a backward situation that only leads to a very high level of concentration in industry after industry. So what do you think it would take to, to change the trend that you've seen over the, the last 30 years? Certainly the, the direction has been attributed to uh, the, Chicago, the Chicago School of Antitrust. Is this something that we need a new school of antitrust? Yeah. Is this something? <laughs> we do. The, the paradigm, the Chicago paradigm is broke. I mean, everybody knows that uh, when you build a model, you are extracting from the real world. And uh, you're hoping that you extract the right uh, phenomenon that will allow you to predict something in the future. Uh, the Chicago paradigm is cracked. A new paradigm does not yet exist. And so we have to model through, recognizing that uh, not only do we want uh, good economics, but we want good administration, good political science, all built into uh, what we do. And uh, I don't have a solution as to what the right way to go is, but I think we have to recognize that uh, uh, the, uh, the microeconomic uh, uh, Chicago approach is, is uh, too narrow. And you know, if you worry about concentration, and I do for reasons that go beyond that the price might go up in the next couple of months, uh, you're, you're left in a, a, a bit of an open situation where, again, right now it's hard to predict, but the outcome is greater concentration in our markets. Well, there are a lot of, of thinkers out there today who, who have different proposals for what antitrust could be expanded to cover. Um, which, uh, is there a particular scholar or economist or, uh, or writer or, or legal mind out there that, that you think has it right? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I think there are a lot of people thinking about these things. Uh, for example, the, uh, the material on choice by Bob Land and Neil Avery uh, is very interesting. Uh, it's got a lot of potential. In fact, the rhetoric is, has changed somewhat over time, such that uh, people talk about choice now regularly in court cases and in articles and speeches as one of the three things that you're really trying to get out of, uh, of competition. The others are price and uh, innovation leading to growth. Uh, choice is hard to operationalize. 
and it's hard to put into a quantitative formula or an algorithm or anything else. But it's got to be one of those things you look at. Dynamism. Uh, Chicago School is largely static in, in worrying about uh, a snapshot of, of price. But it brings in the concept more and more of uh, innovation and where is, how do you fit innovation into it. Um, but innovation requires a longer term view. It's not price oriented as such. And uh, it's probably far more serious in terms of impact on the economy than, uh, than price. Uh, I'll give you an example of in the um, American Airlines US Airways merger that's about to happen. I assume it's about to happen. I don't know anything on the inside. But the Justice Department typically looks at overlapping routes and asks whether there's so much concentration in an overlap that prices might go up in that market. That is a snapshot of today. What they should really be looking at in addition to that is what is the effect going to be when you have these national systems in smaller and smaller numbers competing against each other, but the numbers are being reduced. A national air system deals with advertising and, and marketing and uh, pricing and can move airlines around. They can move uh, carriers around. So you can have a big carrier or a small carrier. You can have more routes, smaller routes, more uh, frequent activity and so forth. This is very dynamic. And we, we should be taking the systems that are out there into account and asking ourselves, how many do we need at minimum? Is three enough? Is two enough? Is five enough? There's no way to draw that line solidly. You don't have economics that's going to give you an answer. It's a political kind of answer. It's political economics. And uh, it takes into account all kinds of things uh, that are not accounted for by the microeconomic static analysis. So, yeah, there are people looking at larger issues. There are economists looking at evolutionary economics, uh, uh, looking at uh, dynamics of the choice theory and at institutional economics, and give it different names, but they're economists. And uh, no, nobody that I know wants to say economics should not be uh, a central player in antitrust analysis. The question is, who's economics? We were acting as if Chicago was the only fount of economic wisdom. And it's not. So how will these others play in? Not clear. How should they play in? It's really not clear. But we need to muddle our way through these situations a little bit better than, than I think we're doing. Well, as the, the primary advocate for, for competition, what do you think is clear about what can very most readily and most easily change about the way antitrust currently operates? I, I think if the, um, you, you've got a problem with the courts, okay? So I understand why justice has to be careful with the courts. FTC may be a little less so, but ultimately uh, you'll get some court decisions. And we don't have much guidance from the courts on, uh, from the Supreme Court on mergers. But there's a lot of room for discretion, and there's a lot of room for uh, uh, jawboning and for a, 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 a Justice Department that wants to be more aggressive to uh, continue the work that I think started with, with these uh, revised guidelines of saying, here's how we're going to look at it. And we're going to take more things into consideration than we used to, or we're going to acknowledge that we do. That's a good way to start. And then you start building. If they wanted to uh, do an analysis of systems in this airline merger, fact of the matter is when you United and U.S. Airways mer uh, almost merged a few years ago, then backed away, in the Justice Department's press release, they said they were taking into account the national systemic uh, issues that were raised. They haven't done that since then as far as I can tell and I don't know whether they will now. But 
you've got the discretion to try these ideas out. And if you can tell a good story, maybe you can convince uh, some courts. So we've talked about the need for maybe a new paradigm, maybe a new courts, uh, maybe, maybe a shift in judicial doctrine. But wouldn't legislative changes, doesn't, doesn't that provide an avenue to do things more quickly and more immediately to uh, change the way that antitrust currently operates? <laughs> what did I see a sign once in the, the Illinois legislature that said, no man, woman, or child is safe while the legislature is in session? There's a lot of fear. Uh, that if you turn Congress loose on some of these issues, uh, you may not be very happy with what you get. Right now, I'm not sure Congress could get anywhere on any issue, uh, uh, but in a positive way, I'm even more skeptical. Uh, when we, we had the airline hearings the other day, each, each senator and Judiciary Committee wanted to know uh, of the CEOs, what are you going to do to my people, to my state? Are we going to continue to be served okay? The answer is, of course, yes. And that's about all they seem to care about. Uh, they're not looking at the big, big picture, and antitrust is not something that's on very many people's minds. Do you think that's maybe where it starts? Does, does antitrust need to be on more people's minds so that the elected representatives would, would take a more progressive approach towards it? Yes. Uh, I'm... I have to say I'm a little bit worried by institutions uh, like Capital Forum and MLEX, and uh, I can name some others that are now putting excellent journalists behind a paywall that may reduce the amount of strong information that the public gets, which hasn't been very much anyway. You're getting great information for uh, people who have a high stake. Uh, but. Uh, the public doesn't know very much about antitrust. They don't know much about economics uh, generally. I can go on and on. But uh, we, we do need more uh, talented and, uh, and uh, reporters who are specialized to put the antitrust questions and the competition policy questions in a way the public uh, can understand. Uh, we, we haven't done a good job on that. The only time you really saw much of that was actually during the big Microsoft case when you suddenly had an explosion of journalistic interest in, in antitrust. After the Microsoft case went away, so did the reporters for the most part. Bert, the, the Sherman Act is over 100 years old. The Clayton Act is close to 100 years old. The FTC Act is close to 100 years old. There's not really many people, not many consumers today were around before when antitrust laws didn't exist. What would happen if there were no antitrust laws, and why do they exist? Well, yeah, I've got an aunt down in Florida named uh, Aunt Betty, and she's a wonderful uh, lady. She probably was around <laughs> about that time when the laws were passed. Um, she was a great shopper. And uh, there was a time about uh, 10 years ago when uh, a number of the... Uh, large department stores began to merge. And she called me up one day. She said, I, I don't know what you do exactly, but that's something to do with this, I think. These department stores I shop in keep merging. If this keeps up, where am I going to shop? I said, Aunt Betty gets it. You know, she didn't understand what antitrust was or merger controls, but she understands that a consumer wants choices. That's where your leverage is as a, as a, uh, a buyer uh, or in almost anything, as a, as a consumer of political information. You want choices. It doesn't have to be a million choices. In fact, that's probably overwhelming. But it's also you don't want two or three. Your leverage is the ability to get up and walk away, or to switch your custom. Uh, so without antitrust, where would we be? Probably as was the case, we would have cartels. A cartel takes away your choice because the people who apparently are competing are in fact colluding so that for that particular purpose to derive you of the choice of prices. Uh, you would have monopolies or at least you would have trusts which were the equivalent is what we call a public uh, like a bank holding company. You put everybody under one 
umbrella where they're central decision making, whether they're legally separate or not legally separate. It's a monopoly. Again, the purpose of the monopoly is to deprive the consumer of choice. And this doesn't only apply to uh, end-use consumers like you and me when we go into the store, or Aunt Betty at the store. It applies to people up and down a supply chain, businesses. A small business or medium-sized business should have as much right to uh, uh, buy from or sell into a competitive market as the, cons the end-use consumer. Uh, antitrust pretty much ignored ignores this today, but that's what uh, monopsony is about. Um, and uh, so what, what I think we want is a society where there's competition at all different levels. It doesn't always have to be fragmented industries by any means. There are a lot of industries that should not be fragmented, and everybody, the economy is better off with a degree of concentration, but then it's how much concentration. Anyway, in the absence of antitrust, I think one of the things that we would see is a reduction in innovation. Why? Uh, because if you're an investor in a, uh, something new, you need to know that you're going to have a fair shot at success in the marketplace. And if you're going into a cartel or you're going against a monopoly and nobody is policing the market, You've got no chance. So if you've got no chance as the entrepreneur, where are your investors going to go? They look at that sort of stuff. So uh, antitrust is actually a promoter of industrial growth and of a larger economy that's growing, and that's good for everybody because it's a bigger pie that can be shared. Let's flip it now. Mm -hmm. What would the economy look like if antitrust laws worked absolutely perfectly? Joe, that's a great question. I mean, we've never seen that happen. We've never come close to seeing it happen. So uh, we don't really know what perfection would be. What I would look for, I, I think you want to know it by its fruits. Do you get good, fair pricing where there's not a big gap between the costs and the price? Do you get a range of choice for everybody in the marketplace? Do you have a dynamic economy in which uh, innovation uh, occurs uh, a lot and not only the invention but the commercialization and the opportunity for new things to come on the market, which by the way gives more choice and also is a kicker to uh, everybody that's already in the market. So those are things that you want. Now in terms of an industry structure, I don't think there is an ideal structure. When you have uh, uh, a very fragmented industry, uh, you don't have a whole lot of incentive for uh, innovation. Uh, prices may be very low, but there's probably not enough incentive for anybody to spend money on R&D. When you have a highly concentrated monopolistic uh, structure, uh, there's going to be some innovation, but it's going to be channeled into uh, the established base. It's going to be channeled in such a way that it isn't going to undermine the monopolists. So probably overall, if you wanted to design a structure, you would want a variety of companies of different sizes operating on different strategies, uh, finding their own way to the marketplace with their own ideas, and uh, you'd get I think you'd get the most innovation. You'd probably also be getting the other things we want. Um, so uh, there's, there's no ideal. This is a moving target, and uh, there are situations where antitrust isn't going to be the solution. Antitrust is not the solution uh, to what I see as the Google problem, for instance. Uh, you may need something like a form of industrial policy where other governmental le levers are, are being manipulated in a um, uh, coordinated way to assure that there's going to be uh, an adequate level of competition. Because antitrust can't do everything, and, and we shouldn't uh, oversell it. It's important. It's much more important than it gets credit for. 
but it's not the be-all and the end-all in trying to make an economy work for the public. Well, we've just gone through with the, the Internet, and now we've seen smartphones, a period of, of, of rapid innovation. Um, I know that <clears throat> many people my age who are, who are in their, their, their 30s are using products that they would have never dreamed of having when they were, were children. So, you know, it, to the extent we can say that antitrust may not be perfect, we see it working for us, um, and there's still room for improvement, where can, we, where, where can antitrust improve and, and where is it likely to, uh, to, to improve next? Um. You know, antitrust is fundamentally uh, political. You don't want political uh, intervention in cases or investigations, but you've got to have a political base that believes in it, believes in markets, in order to provide the continuity, the budgeting, uh, getting good people into office. Ultimately, you've got to have courts that understand this stuff. So. It's, it's tied in. There was a, a, a discussion this morning at the ABA on uh, political aspects of antitrust. And uh, uh, you've got to look at where the, where, uh, there's so many different aspects because politics is always there. And it's not always obvious. Uh, but what I'm getting at is you've got to have popular support in order to have the congressional and executive support that will allow an independent government agency to do its job. And uh, uh, right now we're in a kind of a laissez-faire mode of thinking that uh, is, is working to close down government rather than to utilize it in the, in the best ways. So we've got a way to go before we're going to get into the position where antitrust is actually going to be uh, more aggressively applied and more imaginatively applied. We may see some, uh, some progress. Uh, there's some good people uh, involved in the, in the government in both of the major antitrust agencies. Uh, there's also uh, the international aspect which is, is new. We can talk about that separately, but it's, uh, it has a big impact on what we do and how companies think. Uh, we, need, uh, we need a lot of the key decisions to be made, not in the government, but in uh, boardrooms where uh, people buy into uh, the antitrust idea and at least they understand it well enough to avoid uh, violating the law. If you can get people voluntarily to comply with the law, that's the most efficient type of administration. I think there's a lot more that can be done in that area. Um, but I don't, I, I don't see a, a new picture to tell you that's going to change this way and suddenly things are going to be terribly different. It's, it's evolutionary. It sounds like it begins with education. It does. Well, Bert, it's been an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. We've learned a lot today. Thank you, Joe. A great day.